OK. Um, so I'm just going to start, um, because the beginning is a little bit of background. Um, how many people here have a clue what AppNexus does? All right, reasonable number. So uh, I'm just going to walk you through our, our history, because it's, uh, it's kind of a funny start to us. So uh, we incorporated, uh, I co-founded the business uh, with my co-founder, Brian O'Kelly, in September of 2007. Uh, we came out of uh, a company called Right Media, which was the first online ad exchange. And our first business model, we were kind of at a bar, kind of drunk. Um, and we said, what should we do? Because we decided to do a startup. And we said, well, let's build a cloud, right? And let's take down Amazon. Um, because two guys in a bar who are drunk think that's a, a good idea. Um, so then uh, Brian, our CEO, he flew out west, met a bunch of people like Mark and Dreesen. And Mark, he, he did founded Loud Cloud, which was Opsware. I don't know if you guys know. He said, wow, that's a fantastic idea. You know, you guys should do this cloud thing. It's the right time. So we actually raised money, um, I don't know how, um, to build an infrastructure company. Um, and we decided we are going to be a cloud that was going to provide a nexus for all sorts of different applications. So our thesis was that as more and more things are going online and towards the web, that we build these big data centers and that those data centers will become a location where different technologies start interacting together. Right? And we knew that would work for online advertising. We assumed it would work for other places as well. Um, we, so we incorporated in September, and in January, we actually had our first paying customer. So in four months, we got two data centers live, a couple hundred servers, a network, um, an um, API-driven stack. And I'll, so, let's say in January, the API didn't always work. <laughs> because it, it turns out that actually building your own cloud, at least back then, isn't that hard. Um, you take some servers, a network, uh, Perl, you know, the sysadmins master toolkit. Um, and Zen, and it's actually rather easy to build an infrastructure where you can dynamically push images, launch them, allocate cores and infrastructure, and all that fun stuff. So, and at the time, EC2 was literally just EC2 and S3, so it's not that they had this whole suite of services. Um, but it turns out, you know, I don't know how many of you guys remember 2008, um, but there's a little problem, which is that there, we entered a recession. Um, and it turns out that clouds require lots and lots of infrastructure. Really, clouds are hosting businesses at heart um, with a slightly different model around it, right? Programmatic access to it. Um, and so infrastructure requires a lot of capital. We only had $2.5 million in cash, which isn't a lot once you start talking about thousands of servers. And then, of course, there's no credit, so we couldn't borrow money. And suddenly, we realized that we were going to go bankrupt. Um, and we were <laughs> literally within about three weeks of running out of cash when we finally decided to raise We, we managed to raise money. Uh, series B towards building this ad nexus. So we basically said, okay, let's keep the original thesis that getting everyone into a data center for low latency kind of work makes sense, but let's actually go one level up, let's build our own killer app, and let's build an app platform. So that's what we've stuck to. Um, and you know, every time I talk to engineers and, and tech people, this, this question comes up, and they're like, oh, I hate ads, ads are terrible. Um, you know, they're evil, they clog my screen. I'll give you my simple philosophy on this, which is that um, first, a lot of ads do really, really, really suck, especially the really annoying ones, and I apologize kind of on behalf of everyone who does this to those when you see them. Um, we ban those very aggressively because we don't like them ourselves. Um, but ads do actually fuel the internet economy. So if you look at all these web services you get for free, uh, many of them are fueled by ads, and that's why what we think is actually good. All right, so, oh wait, don't worry, this is just a quick background. So basically, uh, we, we got the old team together from, from Mike Media and started building this ad platform. And the idea was that we'd enable effectively trading of ads inside of this cloud, which we'd already built. Um, and, and here's what we actually do. Um, just this background will give you relevant about kind of how these things work. But the idea is you put a little piece of JavaScript on, on a web page, right, that points towards us. Um, and what we do in about 50 milliseconds, plus some data lookup time, is hold a real-time auction for that actual slot and actually go out and call out to bidders, buyers, and say, how much are you actually willing to pay for this ad impression, right? So web page, and the idea being that for CNN or whoever the publisher is, that they can actually make more money uh, this way because instead of just having a pre-negotiate or an ad not going anywhere, you always get the best market price. Um, so we were the first to do this. We started doing this in December of 08, we served the first real-time ad. Um, and it turns out that this model actually is better than the traditional way of phones and fax machines. Um, and it has absolutely, absolutely exploded. Um, so 
The way it works, just a little bit of details, it's actually fairly straightforward technically. Um, you have a request comes to us, we generate a nice little bit of JSON, we push it over the wire to a bidder, and the bidder can spit back a response. And in that JSON, we, we, we show not lots of nice things like who the user is, so we have a cookie ID, um, what the web page is, what user agents, what browser is the user, the IP address. We can do uh, geo lookups based on IP address, it's fairly easy stuff. And then the person responds back with a price, right, and an actual creative, right? So it doesn't seem so complicated, so why am I here talking about scale is because the problem with online advertising is scale. Um, when we wrote the title of this talk, it, it was 500K. I apologize if you can't see that. Um, this is the last seven days, um, and we peaked uh, probably just, just shy of 800,000 HTTP requests per second. So basically, we do this a lot, um, and we do it day in, day out. Um, and we've been doing it, and our, our growth has been pretty ridiculous. Uh, so this is the actual last three years uh, of our existence. We started, um, I remember when 10,000 a second was a lot, um, and then we hit 100,000 a second. Um, we had a brief disagreement with, with Google, and they turned us off, because Google, uh, Google has an ad exchange where, where they do this as well, and so we subscribe to their impression feeds and enable our clients to bid on their inventory. Um, our metrics went down twice, oops, and then uh, Facebook recently started their own ad exchange. So you see a nice little bump in volume of a couple hundred thousand more. Every second is, of course, Facebook going live. Um, and one thing that I hate this about Graphite, I don't know if you guys know, when you extend your time window, it actually lowers down your averages. So it actually should go up to 800,000 towards the end, but it, but it actually doesn't. Um, so yeah, so we do this a lot. Uh, we just get thousands and thousands of QPS. We generate terabytes and terabytes of actual data. Uh, we have gigabits and gigabits of bandwidth, uh, 50 gigs out, you know, 25 gigs in. And all of this, by the way, all of this bandwidth, none of this is video or, or media content. All of this is actually the HTML. Uh, we do put our videos on Akamai and let them deal with that actual uh, problem. DNS, I thought these stats are fun. We do about 13,000 DNS requests a second. We run our own DNS infrastructure. Uh, just to give you a sense of just the lookups are, are, are hitting pretty crazy scale. So how does all of this work? So let's, let's get into the interesting stuff. So I'm going to go broad, right, talk about the broader infrastructure, and then I'll dive deep a little bit. And please chime in and interrupt if you have specific questions. It turns this into a little bit more of a dialogue than just a, a presentation. Um, but so the way this works is we've got that little iframe, right? Uh, we run four data centers, currently one in LA, two in New York, and one in Amsterdam. Um, all of those are active, 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 active. So all of our data centers are live all the time. Uh, we have a, a full kind of stack in each of those data centers at all times. Um, any, familiar with any cast of DNS networks or you guys listened to the Dyn talk yesterday. So what we run our own, uh, we actually own gslb.com. Uh, I bought that for 500 bucks and the Dyn DNS guys hate me for it. Um, great domain. <laughs> so we actually use GSLB to route users to the local data center. Um, and then we actually spit back multiple A records. Um, so we, we found out that load balancers don't deal with ads uh, well, because load balancers are made for larger pieces of content. And when you start throwing 50,000 two kilobyte you know, in-out HP requests, often with you know, clients who come in and tear down sessions very fast, because there's one ad on a page, uh, that they keel over and die. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but so basically we, we hand out a couple IP addresses. Um, they go to our front end application, which we call the Impus, um, and then we just have a keep live ring across all of our imp buses that um, actually make sure that if one of those dies, we fell over to another box. Um, in those boxes, we have about 516 of these guys today. Um, so you can do the math. Of, they're doing a little over 1,000 a second. We tend to over-provision because we have very, very big spikes in traffic that, as you saw on the growth chart. Um, so the request comes in, um, and then the problem is we need some kind of state, right? And so we've got to actually go and look up uh, user data. Um, so all of that we store server-side. Um, we were actually um, Citrus Leaf, their new name is Aerospike, but I'm going to continue to call them Citrus Leaf. Um, they, they actually, we use them as a key value store here. Um, and so uh, we actually do need to do 800,000 read requests a second. Um, and then we have about 200,000 write requests back, right? So we don't always deliver the ad in all cases, and then when we do, we have to go write back a record. So across our four data centers, we're doing some pretty ridiculous amount of read-write traffic, um, and Citrus Leaf actually has, has, has held up. Um, they've, we've probably hit every single scale bug they've seen, partly because I think we drive the most volume, um, but that actually works, which is really exciting. And then obviously the impulse goes back and, and spits back requests out to the individual decisioning engines. 
Um, and that's that JSON request and response that you actually saw. Um, and so, let's see. Uh, what you see here is everything in the real-time chain is fully horizontally scalable, right? So if we need another 100K of QPS, we spool up another 50 imp buses or 100, whatever the number is. Um, everything is also completely logically separated. So if we lose our user data store, we continue to serve ads because our priority is we are on other websites that are not ours. And if we go down, people get quite pissed off. Um, and so pretty much anything can fail here except for the imp bus. If the imp bus fails colossally, then we are in deep shit. Um, and that's, it's only happened once in the last 18 months and was a fantastically painful experience of taking down American Express's confirmation page because they had pixels on their AT&T sign up page. Uh, so that imp bus is our sacred, <laughs> sacred application. It's kind of like our load balancer in many cases. So that goes down, we're screwed. But then the decision engines behind that, if, if the, even if they go down, the imp bus knows what to do. We'll do kind of just some default non-paying ad because in the grand scheme of things, what matters is that end users see something in that little slot. Um, now, as you might guess, there's no kind of stateful database, right? There's no MySQL being hit here, right? Obviously, we have all of our campaign information, but all of that is actually cached locally and on every single machine. So this is actually a difficult problem. Once you have 1,000 plus servers, how do you get all of them on the same page, right? We can't go query a database and say, okay, we have an ad, you know, who wants to bid on this, you know, how much are they willing to pay, all of these kind of things. Um, and so we've actually pushed, <laughs> Uh, spent a really significant amount of time in building out an infrastructure to make sure that every server we have actually knows what's going on. Um, and the way we do that, so MySQL, as everybody knows, so the, the amount of uh, state that our ad servers need to know about is actually relatively small. Um, the total data set is in gigabytes, like 1.5 or 2 gigs of data. Um, it does change frequently because we have kind of 15,000 users who log into our console product and kind of update their bidding rules and things like that. Um, but the actual data size isn't that big, and so MySQL works just fine, right? When you're talking about kind of hundreds of thousands or millions of rows of data, not really a problem. And MySQL replication also actually works fine. So what we actually do um, is we just replicate um, uh, our primary kind of MySQL transactional store into all of our data centers. Um, and then we have this program we call Batches that chunks up um, any changes that we have, right? And, and makes them available for our front end servers. Now, we used to actually run this in, in PHP and then at some point we had so many servers, so now it's actually well, just a C application that maintains in memory uh, a cache. We use libevent, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. So much like, it's effectively our own memcache, um, but that's smart, right? And it knows uh, incrementally what's changed. And so every front end server says, hey, I'm on revision 1379, you know, and the batch server says, okay, well I got, you know, 70, I've got 80 through 84 for you. We'll push back those four incremental changes to that front end server. Um, it's complicated uh, because one of our problems is, well first, we have to go update state while you have you know, 1,000 queries a second. So we have uh, Sammy, I don't know if you guys, he gave a little talk yesterday with concurrency kit and lock free structures. So it's actually really difficult just to update your state um, in memory, right? Just to do that piece. Um, but then a remarkably difficult challenge is also figuring out what's actually changed. Um, because it, it turns out that, I don't know if how many of you guys know this, but MySQL, um, when you have a transaction that spans across multiple seconds, um, the update time is actually when MySQL writes the row. It's not when the transaction finishes. So if you have a transaction in flight and you pull changes kind of halfway through, Right? You, might, you might think that you're up to date through you know, 3.55 and 14 seconds, but you can have a commit happen at 16 seconds that has an update time of eight seconds. Um, does it, everyone follow? It just really makes your head hurt when you start to think about that. Um, so in fact, our, we have our, our web services team, and Francis is here actually, has spent a ton of time just trying to figure out right, our transactions in flight, what's up to date, and, and actually a ton of engineering just to know what a safe time zone is when I can actually pull these incremental changes. Um, and so what we found is sometimes we have uh, API clients of ours who, who do updates in bulk that we actually have to sleep them just for two seconds just to make sure that we can get transactions to complete and get a safe time window when we know that that last update timer is actually accurate. So all those batches go, um, and then we've got some uh, little data parts here. Um, 
And uh, we also, of course, keep a, a total snapshot uh, of our, our entire data set, right? So at some point, if we need to start from scratch, so if, if server crashes or we do an upgrade, um, we can just pull kind of a full snapshot of the two gigabytes. It doesn't have to go back to MySQL for that in any shape or form. Yep. The, the batches, no, it's not memcache, it's just our own C application that maintains state, right? Um, written on libevent, that's why I was relating it to memcache, because it's, it's very similar <laughs> if you think about it. Um, but it, it's actually, it's just, a lot of this, in terms of our internal protocols, uh, some people give me shit for this, but we just do simple HTTP for most of this stuff, because it works really well, and it's very easy to debug if you have simple problems. So these guys just do a simple HTTP get and say, give me updates since revision, whatever my revision ID, and then we have our, our application that sits there that has in memory kind of just the, the cache of, of whatever changes happened since that state. More questions? Um, most of the time it's good. Uh, it's one or two seconds uh, in terms of actual replication. Again, it's, this isn't that much data. Um, but we're starting to have certain cases where you know, we, have, we store kind of some snapshot of reporting data by campaign. So sometimes we'll get 100,000 updates and then we'll start to see slave lag. Um, and that causes a ton of problems for us. So we're, we're trying to figure out um, more and more pushing um, anything that's non, like the, kind of the transactional objects, they change one at a time and so replication is easy. Anytime we have bulk updates or anything, it has to start going through different pathways. Um, so we start actually, you know, um, we have optimization data in terms of historical click rates and things like that, that we transfer in bulk um, actually directly through, through to the batch master. So they just get an update, they know, you know the new million rows of budgeting information so that they can actually push that to servers. We had to pull that kind of information out of MySQL because of replication issues. Yeah, so it's custom application. Yeah, sorry, uh, all of this is, so the impression most of the bidder, it's all kind of in-house uh, straight C uh, and so all of our own applications here. Can I repeat what, sorry? Oh, perfect, yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, so now, obviously, we do all of these transactions, right? So we have 500,000 transactions that we're doing, or 800,000 every second, and we need to uh, log those, right? And we need to count them, because otherwise, nobody makes any money as part of this. So um, one of our challenges is, of course, how do you do that, right? You can't do that many writes to disk. You would just destroy your machines if all of them were just writing a disk and you'd have blocking issues and God knows what kind of pain. So what we actually do is uh, we, we built our own uh, log streaming application. It's called Packrat. Um, it's a very simple application. It's about 800, 900 lines of code actually. Um, it's very, and it's, in its simplicity, it's very elegant. And what it does is you just do, an, you, you do a simple HTTP auth and you can post data to it. So just a simple HTTP post. Um, and you basically say, well, here's what table it is, so what log table, um, and here's what hour the data is for, and you just start streaming. Um, and basically what all of our front end servers do, there's a cluster of pack rats in each of our da different data centers, and they just try to get rid of their logs as soon as they possibly can. Um, the idea is that they we don't want them hanging out on disk on 1,500 servers hanging out there, and they just go into our data pipeline, which buffers a little bit. There's a little bit of buffering that happens there, but effect effectively, we just try to stream as we can. Uh, we do some snappy compression just to make sure network utilization isn't a problem. Within a data center, it's just totally fine. Um, it's when we take, get to cross data center links that you, you do need, uh, you know, we start generating gigabits of, of data effectively. So uh, we do need to worry about cross data center replication a little bit. Um, and then what's really cool about Packrat is we just built in this simple restreaming mechanism. So you have this concept of, of I've got, I get a stream of data, and what do I do with it, right? And there's three scenarios. Um, one is uh, we have two secondary data centers. So um, our data pipeline only exists in two places, um, one in New York and one in LA. So we've got a full copy of it. Um, and then in Amsterdam, in our secondary data center in New York, we only have our front end ad serving stack. And so those pack rats, all they do is they get their log files and then stream them back up to one of our primary data centers. And if there's issues, they'll log them to disk and they'll try to restream them, right? So if there's network congestion or something like that, these boxes have a, a pretty large amount of disk so that if there's any kind of issues, I think we can withstand something like 48 hours of network downtime um, just locally catching the data on these actual pack rats. But generally, they just stream them off. 
And then in New York and LA, what they do is, well, they, they will do is actually write the data back down to disk and then stream it off to the other coast. So we effectively replicate and make a full copy of all of our log data. Um, and this is in case, you know, if we lose one of our primaries, um, we still have that log data. We can still do our aggregations and, and, and all of our data pipeline. And then what we have is, is an application, we call this our data management framework, that basically tracks the state of all data. Um, and what all of these servers do, what's inherent in PackRat and PackRat client, is a notification to the data management framework whether or not you have data um, and what the status is. So all of their servers on the edge are basically communicating back and saying, hey, I have some data on disk, which they should never have, right? Or PackRats might say, I have data on disk. And this way we can track at the end of an hour, so we do reporting currently on an hourly basis, um, whether or not we've collected every single log file that's out there. Right? So when every single pack rat says, check, I'm clear, I have no more data for the 11 o'clock hour, we can then kick off our data pipeline, um, our, our aggregation processes. So far, questions, comments, make sense? Criticism, heckling, no? Um, all right, so, so what do we do now? Right? So we've got this data, it's about two or three terabytes in a peak hour um, uh, of, of actual log level data. Um, and uh, what we do is we, we actually now send it to multiple different places. So back in 2009, uh, we were building our data pipeline and we bought an Ateza. Is anyone here an Ateza customer? Everyone? Oh, we've got an Ateza customers. So an is like you, you love it and you hate it. It's like, it's kind of like, hate it, you got thumbs down, yeah. In 2009, we loved it because we had limited engineering teams and it let us build a data pipeline very quickly. Um, in 2010, we hated it um, because it's a big black box and you have no clue what the hell the thing is doing. Um, and then one day, magically, it shuts down and it doesn't come back up for eight hours and nobody knows why, including Natiza Engineering. Um, but so, <laughs> we started on Natiza, we're actually, literally there's like two legacy things still left on there, so there's almost no kind of log level data on there anymore. Um, uh, partly because it certainly is not horizontally scalable to buy seven-figure appliances. Um, and so primarily now, our data actually goes uh, straight into uh, Hadoop, HBase. Um, and uh, we also actually use this exact same data pipeline for our metrics. So we, we realized that we're having, we're, our front-end boxes used to write directly to Graphite. I don't know how many of you guys are using Graphite. That started causing problems, so we actually just set up this exact same data streaming infrastructure, which is effectively real-time streaming, and we now aggregate, collect, and stream from a very limited uh, number of locations into our Graphite servers so that they don't keel over and die, um, which you know, has definitely happened if you saw our scale graphs. Um, but so, and then, of course, we do dumb backup. Uh, currently, we just have actually dumb NFS um, also a scale issue, NFS, the problem is how do you actually do something with that data? Um, so we're actually in the process of building out, um, uh, we're calling it, for some reason our Hadoop clusters have rat team names, uh, but Grandmaster is our, our kind of big fat Hadoop cluster where we're gonna get several petabytes of disk um, and just be able to push our, our log data there. But then of course also be able to, so it'll be backup, but also we'll be able to do intelligent things with it, which right now it just sits there and we don't do anything with it, versus being able to do kind of long-term analytics, ad hoc analytics, kind of big queries that span across months, uh, which as you can imagine, with 15 terabytes of data, becomes uh, somewhat difficult. Um, so the way we aggregate, uh, I don't know if this is new or not, but we've got our terabytes of log data, um, and then we have basically a, a chain, kind of a waterfall, I, I wish I brought the diagram to show you guys, um, where we take disparate log files, because often we have impressions, like ad views, we also have bids, and we also have click, and we also have conversion data. So often we have to join those, so we've got these billions and billions of rows that we need to join on a unique auction ID, um, which is also becomes a pain. And a funny little story, we found out that, so uh, I don't know how many of you guys use UUID, right? UUIDs are normally 128-bit. Um, it turns out that most processes are 64-bit. So if you do 64-bit, if you can compress your UUID down to 64 bits, you're fine. Um, so we thought we were really smart three years ago when we did that, and so we said we're gonna do a 64-bit UUID. Um, the only challenge is now that we see 30, sorry, our daily volume, our peak, our last peak was 38.5 billion ads. When you do 38.5 billion 64-bit UUIDs, it turns out you get collisions every day. Um, so our team now has to deal with the fact that our unique ID isn't always unique anymore. Um, so we do this, uh, so we do our aggregation, um, and currently we can do it in about 40 minutes. So it takes us about 40 minutes to go through and take uh, our, our peak hours worth of data. 
Um, and as part of that, we're doing about 64 different column ETL aggregation jobs. Um, so there's 64 different stages, and a lot of that also involves syncing across different clusters. So our problem is if I have a billion records and I want to count up just how many impressions were on CNN, how many were on New York Times, right, that's one problem. But then the other thing I need to do is when I have a conversion event, so I don't know how many of you guys know how this works, so when you see an ad for, say, eBay, right, um, you don't have to click on that for us to be able to tell whether or not that ad influenced your, your buying behavior. Um, because there's a pixel on eBay that fires and sends data, and this is standard practice, there's a pixel on AT&T on, on every major marketer that sends us purchase information, right? And so one thing we need to do is when we see a user ID that converted, we now need to look up all the impression history for that user ID in bulk as well. Um, that's why we actually use HBase. We actually store two copies of all of our log level data in two data centers, so you end up with four copies. Um, and so that we can actually do a lookup by user ID. So if you give me a specific user ID, we can pull up the full impression history. And then if there's a purchase event, see if there was an associated impression that should get some credit for that or multiple. Um, so those are some of the big data challenges and that's why it takes us 45 minutes or 40, 45 minutes to actually do this. Um, and then once we aggregate, uh, obviously we have to provide reports back to our end clients. Um, and uh, we, we did a, a POC about a year and a half ago uh, between Vertica and Perixel. How, how many people here have played with vertical uh, columnar data stores? Not enough, you guys need to. This is really exciting stuff. Um, so columnar data stores, how many people know how they work, actually? Um, so not many. So uh, all of our reporting is basically highly aggregated, right? So we can't do reporting on log level data. It's just too much data. We're not gonna let you run a report on 15 terabytes of log data. And so instead, we have to turn that into some, some sort of aggregation, right? So you might imagine we have a table that has the buyer, the seller, the publisher, the advertiser, the creative, the placement, the country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those, of course, are all just simple IDs. And then we have uh, counts of impressions and clicks and, and money. Um, the way columnar data stores work is, is really fantastic because what they do is instead of storing X bytes per row, so your traditional database will store 1,000 bytes, right? If you have X columns that make up 1,000 bytes, they'll allocate 1,000 bytes of memory, right, to every single row. Of course, var varchars, whatever, you can have something different. What columnar data stores do is they flip it upside down, and instead of storing by row, they store by column. And so if you have a column, say, clicks, which is often zero, right, because you might have five impressions, 10 impressions, 1,000 impressions, and two clicks, right? Instead of storing you know, uh, that 64-bit uh, integer over and over and over and over again, um, or even a smaller integer, it just says, oh, okay, I have um, 4,000 rows in a row that are actually zero. So you end up with a really massive amount of compression. And then, of course, if you want to deliver a report that aggregates that information, that aggregation can now go blazing fast. Uh, the only problem is you now have to store inside Vertica your data in multiple column um, uh, projections so that you, because the problem is you have to have uh, some sorting index, but if you sort by seller, I can now do an aggregation based on seller by just going through that column and just running through it, and I know that at 4,000 times zero is zero, right? So that's actually pretty easy. Um, so it results in actually blazing, blazing fast queries, and we have uh, currently, uh, it's interesting scale, should we provide our clients too much data? We have about 30 terabytes of data inside of Vertica. This is our aggregated data. It gets hit about 80,000 times a day um, and our average response time is still something like, uh, what was it, Francis? It's like eight, nine seconds. <laughs> um, but so, so Vertica lets us actually provide those reports to our clients um, with, with, with really, really, really high speed. Is this stuff interesting, by the way? I'm just, I keep going, all right. What's that, sir? How many nodes on Vertica? Um, I am not 100% sure. I think it's about 20? 20 node cluster? Do you know Pete? No. It's about 20. Um, I know Citrus Leaf is about 20. Um, so so uh, apparently obli obligatory at Surge is a little bit of disaster porn. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a couple stories and I'll show, you all, so show off some tools. Um, so first, I truly, truly, truly despise load balancing vendors. Um, I love the talk just before this where these guys were saying, you know, don't use load balancers, use software. Um, and mostly because I've gotten screwed by all three of these vendors um, across two different companies. Foundry was right media history, they just didn't work. Um, F5, we started with F5 version on the cloud. We had hardware load balancing as part of the service and we used it for ad platform when we first started. Um, and then the problem was F5 has all these bugs. 
and they would have this nasty bug where the pair, so you have this redundant pair, and you have a master and a slave, and hey, don't worry about it, one of them dies, we've got the failover. Well, the problem is when the bug hits both servers, you have no load balancers anymore, right? And we had a bug where once every three days, the load balancers would both spontaneously reboot, um, which is very helpful. So you're down for you know, two, three minutes, however long for, <laughs> it takes for them to come back up. We had that problem for a month. So for a month, we had terrible uptime because every few days we'd go down for a couple minutes. And as you can imagine, not okay in our business. So we said, okay, first we said, let's switch to Citrix. So um, we, we, we got a few net scalers in um, and we did this try to buy thing. And as you can see, our volume was growing really fast and we were actually expecting a huge spike in volume. It was in about four or five weeks or something like that. But NetScaler says, yeah, no problem. We'll get you a demo pair. And then if you like it, you keep it, no problem, right? Um, and this was in our West Coast data center. So we had remote hands install the pair, we start testing out these NetScalers, see if they're better in F5s, and they can handle load really well. Or actually, they were, they were much better in the F5s. And then, you know, it was like the week before we were going live, we started to test failover. And every time we failed over, the thing would just die. Um, and it turns out that Citrix shipped us a pair, but the pair was not of equal size. Uh, they sent us one beefy box, I forgot the model, and then kind of one little itty bitty kind of entry level box. And so there was no redundancy. And this is actually then in, in, we realized we had about 72 hours to get something up, and in 72 hours we ended up with the, the Keep Alive DNS solution. Uh, we already had our GSOB servers live, and, and that's how we ended up without load balancers. And I can tell you, it's been blissful. Our, our Keep Alive DNS in the last three years since it's been live has caused a problem, I think, once. Um, once Keep Alive started doing weird things and kind of incorrectly uh, ARPing VIPs, but it wasn't even a serious problem. It just caused a little bit of slowness uh, versus load balancing vendors where, uh, you know, this was effectively a monthly or bi-monthly kind of production firefight. We got a similar story. I'll, I'll talk about mistakes we make too. Um, so our, our key value store, back in 2009, there was not a lot in the open source community uh, in terms of key value stores that actually worked. Memcache DB had just worked. A lot of companies were taking Berkeley DB and doing that and caching and, and trying to build things. And so uh, our CEO met the CEO of this company called Schooner. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with this. And Schooner, they, their CEO promised our CEO that they had the appliance that solved all of our problems. And they would ship us a box that would just magically take, make this problem go away. And it was a persistent, persistent Memcache. Um, so we made the mistake to accept this and then Four weeks later, we were going into production, and then suddenly they notified us that they were discontinuing their hardware program and turning into a software company, um, but that we were welcome to support this ourselves. Um, so that was also not very much fun. Um, that's where Citrus Leaf, actually, these guys did a ton for us, because they, I met Brian and Srini when they were two guys that hadn't even raised money yet. Um, and I was in this situation, they said, look, give us like two weeks, and we'll get something up and running. Um, and they actually did, so kudos to them. Um, the interesting thing about key value stores though, so we do persistence on our cookie store. Um, and I thought this was actually pretty interesting stuff. Um, once this stuff starts to scale, um, it turns out SSDs like melting down. Um, and, and many of them, uh, this is also, SSDs didn't really become production ready until very recently. Um, and this is a study we did actually together with Citrus Leaf guys about a year ago. Um, when we started looking at our, our key value stores, they had these degrading performance patterns. So we would kind of turn a server live, and six weeks later, you would start to see serious performance degradation. And it's just because the SSDs, we were writing to them so often, they couldn't actually take it. Um, so this is actually the results of our performance benchmarks that we did. Um, and you can just see, uh, the, the, our, our, our SLA here, by the way, is to get a read in under a millisecond. So this is a percentage of requests that take longer in one millisecond, right? Um, and then you just see what happens to most of these drives. And a year ago, we only found one drive and that could kind of sort of keep up. And this is under a 3x write load. So this is under pretty significant kind of stress. Um, but pretty much every single disk drive starts failing. And many of them start failing even at our, our initial load. We'd start getting 5 to 10% of our reads that would take, you know, 10 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, things like that. And if you remember our, our first slide, well, guess what? We only have 50 milliseconds to do what we do. So if our reads start taking that long, we're in trouble. Um, so this currently, that, that open 98%, most of those are actually less than 8 uh, milliseconds. So we can still actually do all of our processing 99.99% of the time. And of course, if we don't have cookie data, it's not the end of the world. We just kind of return something slightly, not random, but a little bit more ad hoc. 
Um, I'll do, do one more quick disaster story, because this one was truly hell on earth. Um, this was 11-11-11 um, was the actual date, which probably means something. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, two of our data centers go offline, just totally disappear off the face of the planet. Um, and what happened is that you know, our network team logged into the core switches, and they see just a flood of ARP traffic. So there's just ARP traffic coming from random MAC addresses, just nonstop. And, and the core switches are just, just keeling over. They can't deal with it. And it takes minutes to run a single command on a core switch. So, of course, just debugging to figure out what's going on took us 20 minutes or something like that. And meanwhile, you know, we're running all of our traffic out of you know, actually less than half of our infrastructure. Um, and so we're trying to find the source. And at some point, first we thought we got DDoS. It uh, turned out that wasn't the case. It turns out that the traffic was coming from inside of our network. So then we thought we got hacked, uh, which was really scary. Um, and then the problem is we couldn't identify the source of the traffic since all the ARP requests were spoofing MAC addresses from what seemed like random. So it looked like every server was doing something like uh, 50 ARP requests a second. Take that times several thousand servers and you know, your, your core switch goes down. Um, and so our, our, our systems team spent 10 hours in these data centers and they would shut down, they shut down every single rack because we had access to the power switches. They shut down, uh, shut down the switches on every single rack, and then one at a time would turn the rack back on, right, and see if there was kind of a bad server. Um, and what actually turned out to be, it turned out one of our sysadmins screwed up one of his releases um, and misconfigured Zen bridges um, to start acting like a network switch, which would then relay every single ARP request it saw. <laughs> so human error resulted in 12 servers across two data centers basically taking us down. And as you can imagine, when you play whack-a-mole, literally whack-a-mole, as in turn off the rack, turn it on, oh crap, that didn't work. Well, now it takes three minutes to turn it back off because the switch goes back down. Um, so that was probably our most spectacular outage ever. The good news I'm proud to say is we were still up 99.2% of the time. So our ads, even with limited infrastructure with kind of half, more than half, it was two thirds of our global servers down. We managed to still serve ads kind of slowly um, globally. So that was actually uh, pretty exciting for us. So one thing I thought would be fun, so let me pause for, for questions, just a minute. Well, questions, comments? Um, one thing I thought I'd show off real quick. I have 10 minutes, yeah. So one thing I thought I'd show off real quick is, is talk a little bit about DevOps. Um, so one thing that has, has enabled us, uh, currently we have four sysadmins that manage all of our servers uh, and applications. So We've got 3,000 plus servers with four, four guys. Um, and one of the things that has enabled us to do that has actually been our investment in production tools. Um, and I thought I'd just show this off real quick because I think it's really cool and the team is awesome and what they've built is really good. So what we decided two years ago was that uh, we should treat DevOps like an engineering team. We should treat this like a production application. Um, we should architect it like a production application. And so we actually built this client server model. We have a, this is fully API driven actually. So we have a, a UI that hits an underlying Maestro API that manages pretty much everything we have in production. And uh, so what you see here uh, is basically kind of the, the main screen where we see kind of all of our production impression bus boxes. And you see here's our you know, 500 plus boxes. And of course, kind of stupid details like what the Nagios checks are, kind of whether it's up, what the status of the box is. And what's cool is right from here, we can then start doing all sorts of things. So now, I'm not gonna do a production release in front of you guys, because that sounds like a, a bad idea. Um, but you can just start running commands on the actual servers, right? So for example, if I wanna run date, um, I can run date, which is of course just gonna tell me the time of the server. Um, I can specify what percentage of the plant I wanna run it on. So here I did 25%. So no more than 25% of our servers should have this command running at a time. Um, and then I can actually just run this command. Uh, what's cool is I can actually also uh, chain commands back to back. So here's a fail script. This is just a test script. All it's gonna do is actually return an error to prove that errors actually work. Um, um, and I can actually run multiple tasks across hundreds of servers, across all of our data centers, just in parallel. Um, and it's really cool. So we've got a couple, actually several boxes that run as, as task processors um, that call our, call our actual Maestro APIs, get work, um, and then start running it in parallel. And so you can see here we're running you know, 93 different tasks. Um, and you can see which servers they ran on, you can see the output messages. It looks like, um, ironically, we have a server that has a bad time. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it thinks it's 15 seconds after the hour, and everyone else thinks it's eight seconds. Um, so there would be a problem with NTP <laughs> on this actual box. 
Um, but it's very cool because you can actually start doing things in bulk. So if I want to do a rolling upgrade, there's a runbook here to do an upgrade. So I just select 400 servers, and as you can imagine, upgrade might take a while because I'm reading two gigs of data. I have to load all this into memory. Um, but you can just do that seamlessly using this tool. And then if, if there's any kind of uh, process output you might want to see, you can also get that here. You can run TCP dumps, all sorts of fun stuff. And then we also started turning this into our, our firefighting tool. Because uh, we found, you know, sometimes we have, have server issues, so you could actually see a real-time status. We found that Nagios for us is too slow. Um, Nagios, we, we send so many different messages to Nagios, we get so much information there that we don't actually know what's going on anymore. Um, and so this is actually a, a, a true real-time status of everything that's actually happening. Um, and if all goes well, we should see this drop down to 99% because we have a weird issue with a couple servers in Amsterdam. Yep. Yes, uh, so we still use Nagios. You, you rarely, you, we log into the Nagios UI just kind of to get status. Um, everything in Nagios is auto-generated from this. Um, so people set up uh, their pager rotations. So I'll show you here. Um, so we have uh, different pager rotations for different groups. So our, our ad server production team is currently live. Um, you can set different rotation schedules, primary escalations, all here, and then it generates a Nagios config from that. Yeah, all, all Nagios does today is just does the checks and then it kind of sends uh, the actual pagers to individual engineering teams. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because we're at the state where our monitoring needs a serious overhaul because Nagios doesn't have kind of very intelligent monitoring of saying, hey, guess what? If four impression buses crash, we really don't care. You know, don't tell us about it. But if 40 crash, we do care, right? So we need to start putting these kind of thresholds and logic in place, and we can't do it with Nagios. It's completely insufficient. So right now, we kind of have the, the overpage problem um, because, as you can imagine, we have servers that die pretty much every night because we have thousands of them, right? Um, so any other questions? Yeah. Um, so we were using Puppet rather extensively and have started to try to move away from it, actually. Um, especially for, so we, we currently use Puppet for all of our core um, kind of just OS level stuff, and for certain applications we still use it for releases to manage RPM installs. Um, but first, Puppet is actually slow, um, we found. So in terms of when we want to do an upgrade, we really want it to go as fast as possible. And then because you can't kind of program steps very easily in it, we want to do things like, hey, upgrade this box, run this quick test suite on this box, if it's okay, upgrade 10 other boxes. That kind of logic wasn't working well. So we're actually starting to move away from it a little bit um, for our, our, our release management. As a side note, what you're showing with uh, running commands in multiple boxes at the same time, Chef has something similar uh, with Knife SSH where you can actually do a search to pull a list of boxes based on different criteria and run commands on it. Yeah. So it's the same thing without the interface. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and by the way, we have uh, our team, because it's all API driven, our team actually went. Um, and wrote some of their own uh, actual management tools. So the most simple one is someone wanted to know what boxes are in production, um, wanted, you know, wrote a tool called mfind, where I can go and say, give me boxes that are in production. Or I can say, give me boxes that are in production that are serving Google traffic, right? And I know this is the boxes that are just dedicated to that. Um, and then they went to the next step and said, well, what if we could actually start executing commands on those boxes, right? So what if I log into those boxes and check the status of those boxes, right? Let me see if I can run that in, in parallel. And, oh, hold on, that's not nice. Let's do make that, let's make that pretty in terms of its output. Um, and so our team started building these tools because everything we do is in bulk, right? So, and what's nice is this just hits our standard Maestro APIs, right? So um, we're on a path where we're now 300 some odd people. You know, when you're a small startup, you give everyone root access everywhere, you don't care. What's nice about this is we can continue to give all of our development teams very strong levels of production access, but have deep auditing in terms of what they're actually doing, because since all of this is hitting a standard API, I can put in controls, I can put in logging. Um, I don't know these are things that a CTO thinks about at this stage. Um, trust me, it really sucks. Um, but so we can actually start putting deep controls about what people are doing, um, but still let them start running things in bulk. So I, we haven't played with the, the Knife Chef tool set, but this, this is ours, um, and we like the fact that 
we can do a lot. And we, we've talked about potentially open sourcing some of this as well, uh, because we see definitely a gap, uh, a gap in the market. More questions? So the question was, our aggregation currently takes 40 minutes. Oh, when do we hit kind of over an hour? So uh, a month ago, it was actually taking us two hours <laughs> because we still had one job running on Atiza, and that Atiza would continually just struggle. And you know, we, we, we had this issue where Atiza shipped us a bad set of disks. So we had a 20% a failure rate of disks in our Atiza appliance. That sucked. Um, and so uh, we actually just uh, optimized it down to 40 minutes. And the way it's set up now, in theory, we should be able to keep it at that time frame. Um, and in fact, we're trying to accelerate it even more. Um, so currently, we have processed data in hours, but there's no reason we can't do continuous processing, right? So all we need to do is start understanding minutes, right? And then we can actually, maybe it's not a minute, but we're doing five minute intervals. So the team is talking about doing most of the aggregation actually as the data is streaming in. So as soon as we know that we have five minutes worth of data, kicking off the jobs to do that aggregation. Um, and so we're trying to actually cut it down um, and see if we can get it, you know, potentially have real-time stats going through the hour, right? And then final stats, you know, 25, 30 minutes after the hour. Um, so we're trying to actually improve the times. R or, or any groupy kind of software to optimize stuff? So, sorry, are we doing any optimization behind the scenes? Uh-huh. Um, uh, you mean, like, performance optimization uh -huh. or? Uh, performance, performance optimization. So I'm not actually 100% familiar with all the optimization, and on the data pipeline, you mean, or on? E even offline optimization, not in real time, but any, anything offline, right? Um, well, OK, so uh, in terms of the, uh, we do have an optimization team that does optimization algorithms and things like that, because that's where you're getting at. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they run a similar offline process that I didn't cover here, but they, they take a feed of log or aggregated data, do some analytics and optimization modeling on top of that. Um, and that also all has to be distributed, right? And they use a lot of HBase for this. Um, and then in terms of kind of actual, it was optimization of the actual underlying data infrastructure. Our team spent a ton of time tweaking kernel settings, tweaking OS settings, finding the right hardware. It's a real pain in the ass to make Hadoop actually do what you want it to do. Uh, so it actually took the team months to get the actual performance characteristics we wanted. Dog, Linux systems and then tune it, and what, what type of um, um, code are you running? And it is mostly C, which you can optimize at low level, or yep. are you running higher level languages? So, uh, so the question was kind of what kind of technology stack we're running. Um, so we uh, run, yeah, standard CentOS, uh, not too kind of customized, but as bare bones as possible. Um, all of our real time applications are, are C. Um, all, of our, all of our front ends, and uh, we, we're a big PHP shop, actually. So kind of the UIs our clients log into are all just kind of very straightforward layup stack. Um, and that's because we're not dealing with kind of the scale problems major consumer sites have. It's an er enterprise application, right? So we have thousands of people using our tool, not millions. Um, and then obviously, kind of in terms of MapReduce, there's a little bit of Java uh, going on. Um, and we're starting to play around with Python a little bit as well. Uh, but primarily C in, in LAMP, um, and then a little bit of Java. More questions, comments? All right. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you guys enjoyed it.